Hi, this is Jonine Ford, and I am presenting my journal club entry for this week. Um, and I chose the article uh, entitled The Low Fob Map Diet Reduces Irritable Bowel Symptoms in Patients with Inflammatory Bowel Disease. Uh, this week's case um, that we were supposed to pick an article for um, has a young fellow, MB, a 12-year-old male patient with inflammatory bowel disease. The patient has been in remission for approximately one year but reports a significant flare-up following ongoing accidental exposure to dairy yogurt, misrepresented as coconut. MB's doctor gave him resveratrol um, in an effort to reduce inflammation. This intervention did not change the patient's symptoms of bloody stools and diarrhea. Um, and so for that reason, um, we were supposed to find an article um, that we could uh, possibly use um, as reference for an intervention that we might use on the case of MB. So I chose um, this article. Um, so the authors are listed here, um, and you can see their respective um, institutions that they're affiliated with. Um, so we have people that are um, associated with hospitals and also with colleges. Um, the journal that um, the article comes from is the World Journal of Gastroenterology. Um, and the World Journal of Gastroenterology, um, and this is directly from their website, is a high quality online open access single blind peer reviewed journal published by the Beishending publishing group. Um, they focus on gastroenterology primarily, but also hepatology, gastrointestinal oncology, and pediatric gastroenterology. So let's dive into the research here. So um, the research question of this particular article was, would a low FODMAP diet alter IBS symptoms, IBS-like symptoms, and improve the quality of life among IBD patients? Um, they did not explicitly state a hypothesis, although um, I would assume by their introduction that they would think that the answer would be yes. Um, so anyway, does it observe the four basic components of a good re research question? Um, so using the PICO method, I uh, assess the research question. So does it include the population? Yes. In the research question, it clearly states that the population that's being studied is going to be IBD patients. Um, does it state the intervention in the question? Yes. Um, the intervention will be a low FODMAP diet, which is clearly stated in the research question. Does it mention a control in the research question? No, a control is not mentioned. And does it state an outcome in the research question? And the answer to that is yes, the outcome is stated um, is alter IBS-like symptoms and improve the quality of life. So if they had rephrased the research question to say, would a low-fat FODMAP diet alter IBS symptoms um, and improve the quality of life among IBD patients uh, greater than a control or greater than a different type of diet or greater than a lack of intervention, uh, then they could have met the PICO criteria. So um, the appraisal of the existing, ep existing evidence. Um, so um, a couple of things I did in order to kind of like look and see what was currently out there. The first thing I did was I actually uh, scrolled down to the references of this particular article to see what they actually used as um, resources um, for their uh, research. Um, and there for their literature review. And so there were 13 FODMAP related citations in the article's references. Um, and then I went to PubMed and I did a search of the literature, <coughs> excuse me, for ir irritable bowel disease, a low FODMAP diet, that was what I used for the, um, the search criteria. And when I typed that in, um, in addition with, uh, I used filters um, so it was five-year filter I put in human, and um, when I did that, uh, I came back with 34 clinical trials, one case report, 70 reviews, and four observational studies. So within the last five years, this is um, the, the, um, the base of what we have 
Um, I'm sure that you know, if I would have expanded it to 10 years or even have taken um, the time limitations off of the filter, then I probably would have gotten a lot more responses or results. Um, so that being said, it seems like there is a, a good amount of existing evidence um, in favor of the FODMAP diet. Um, but what makes this diet, this uh, particular article stand apart, um, according to the to the researchers or to the clinicians that wrote this, um, I have it in quotations here. That this is the first prospective randomized study conducted in a Danish population investigating the impact of a low fat FODMAP diet among IBD patients in remission or with mild to moderate disease activity with IBS-like symptoms. So in their area, this was the first study of its kind, which is significant because, um, you know, not um, research um, outcomes don't necessarily um, apply, apply cross cultures um, due to, you know, differences in food availability um, and things like that. So um, that being said, it you know, I still consider it to be um, a reputable article, um, even though it kind of, in my opinion, proves what we already knew was pretty, um, a pretty effective approach to dealing with IBD. So the study design that they used, um, this was a randomized control trial. Um, however, it was not blinded. Um, and that's because um, it was pretty much impossible to um, blind the clients um, because they had to actually prepare the food themselves and they had to be educated on the type of diet to follow. So um, it was not a randomized, controlled, blind uh, study, but it was um, randomized uh, nonetheless. There were 89 patients recruited from a hospital in Copenhagen, Denmark. And the randomization, um, the patients were basically random, randomly assigned. Um, the person who did it had envelopes for each person. Um, the person who randomized or passed out the envelopes was not a part of um, the clinical, um, the clinical trial, um, or the clinic, the clinicians, I guess I should say, the staff. The person was a person that was not involved in the study at all. Um, and they passed out envelopes, and when the participant opened the envelope, they found out which group they were in. So there was a treatment group, um, and the treatment group followed the low FODMAP diet, and then there was a control group, and the control group was basically just told to continue the diet that they were previously following. So we call this group the habitual group. So the inclusion criteria for the study, um, they had to be IBD patients. Um, there were mainly two groups, um, ulcer ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, they had to be, their symptoms had to be in remission or the, their disease had to be in remission. Um, they could have mild to moderate disease activity. Um, they could have mild to moderate IBS symptoms. Um, all of them had to be on a treatment of, of one of the three um, things mentioned here. So the five amino salad, salic acid, um, the azathioprine, I'm not familiar, so please excuse my mispronunciation, um, biologicals, or a combination of those things. Um, so they had to be under some sort of treatment, um, but no additional medicines or treatments could be used either four weeks before the study or start it when the study starts. Um, the exclusion criteria, um, the IBD, um, if, it's, it, if it was moderate or severe, um, or if they were in relapse, um, active relapse with uh, acute symptoms, then um, they could not participate. Um, if they had used steroids within four weeks of the study, then they could not participate. If they were vegetarian, they could not participate. If they had celiac disease, lactose intolerance, allergies of any sort, or alternative diet regimen. Um, so if they were, you know, not really following a normal diet, but they were following some sort of specific diet to deal with um, IBD, then they were excluded. 
this to me presented um, somewhat of an issue um, just because many people in, um, in my experience with IBD are, are fall into one of those categories. Um, many of them have, have um, intolerances that they deal with food intolerances. Many of them have allergies. Many of them actually do follow an alternative diet in order to keep those things in remission um, and, to, and to keep the symptoms at bay. So um, that could eliminate a large population of people and could also um, skew the results um, of the, the study. Um, so that was interesting to me that they had so many um, exclusions. All right, so here's how the study worked. Um, everyone who was included, which was about 89 people, um, all received a 30-minute initial dietary assessment. During this assessment, um, a nutrition professional met with clients individually, talked to them about um, the study um, very generally, um, and then took an assessment of what they eat on a normal basis. So it was a, a food frequency questionnaire that they were given, right? Um, so then the people were split into their two groups and they saw their respective practitioners. So the treatment group, um, they had an initial um, consultation that lasted for one hour. Um, during this counseling session, they got handouts, recipes, meal plans, um, and some tips and strategies from their um, practitioner to help them throughout their process. So they received a great deal of um, support at the very beginning. Um, and then um, at the end of their treatment, they got a 30 minute follow up. Um, and this 30 minute follow up was generally just to give them um, strategies for reintroducing the higher FODMAP foods to their diet. Um, in my opinion, uh, this probably wasn't enough. I, I didn't mention, but this was a six week um, study period or trial period. So um, over the six weeks, they only met with their practitioner at the beginning of the six, six weeks and then at the end. Um, and at the end, that six weeks um, consultation only was a 30 minute consultation. Um, and in my opinion, a reintroducing um, session should probably be longer than that. And it should probably happen over multiple sessions and not just one. At least that's how I would do it. Um, so to me, that was a little, uh, I, you know, I guess below my standard. <laughs> um, but, you know, whatever works for them, I guess. Um, in the control group, however, uh, they did not get any initial um, dietary counseling. They just, after their 30 minute assessment, um, they were told to just follow their normal diet and then um, they would um, uh, reach back out to them later. During the six weeks, they were given questionnaires to fill out um, and those questionnaires basically measured their symptoms, um, their feelings, um, as far as um, their quality of life, um, how difficult they felt adherence was, um, if they were adhering, that type of thing. Um, and those questionnaires were completed via computer. So um, I have two tables to show for the study results. Um, so here you can see that um, it's broken down by the type of uh, assessment that was given. Um, so we have the irritable bowel syndrome symptom severity system <laughs> um, test, uh, the simple clinical colitis index, the Harvey and Bradshaw index, the irritable bowel syndrome quality of life, and the short inflammatory bowel disease questionnaire. So these, is basi these are basically all questionnaires that um, were provided to participants um, to measure um, their outcomes um, at the beginning um, of the study and then at the end of the study. And you can see that um, the low food, uh, low FODMAP diet um, all returned um, stati uh, statistically significant results um, for each test. 
I skipped. Yeah, so as you can see, again, um, all of the results here are um, statistically significant um, for the low FODMAP diet, except for um, IBD mild to moderate activity, which is not statistically significant. All right, so um, the study strengths that I found were that it had a reasonable number of participants. Um, it wasn't, you know, astronomically large, but 89 is a pretty good number. Um, however, uh, 89 was just a starting number. Uh, there were 11 people who dropped from the study, um, and I think four were in the control group and seven were in the, the low FODMAP group. Um, and the seven that dropped from the low FODMAP group dropped because they felt the diet was too difficult to follow. Um, so that's something to keep in mind um, as we consider using the low FODMAP diet for um, our clients. Um, there was pretty thorough nutrition counseling and education at the onset of the study. Um, so at the very beginning, they did get a lot of you know, handouts, nutrition education, tools, recipes, meal plans. Um, so they got a lot of tools in order to make the diet work, um, which was great. And um, there were some objective measurements included. Um, so there were some inflammatory markers tested, um, which is great um, because you, you know, you can't really say that someone felt um, any way about a C-reactive protein lab marker. So it's, it's an objective measurement. Whereas the limitations, in my opinion, were that one, the participants were not blinded, so they knew which um, which um, group they were in. Um, the participants that did not receive the um, nutrition intervention could have easily gone online, you know, after they left and looked up the low FODMAP diet as an intervention and followed it anyway. Um, so we just don't really know what they were doing, um, but they they knew that they were participating in a study um, which you know could have uh, skewed the results in some type of way um, nutrition support during the intervention period was limited in both groups so even though the intervention group did receive a good amount of nutrition education at the beginning during the six weeks there was no um, interaction um, it was, well, as far as nutrition education is concerned, it was really just questionnaires that they were answering. Um, and I felt that um, if the, if both groups really, but especially the intervention group got more support, um, then possibly they could have even experienced more um, benefits from the diet. And then the study relied heavily on uh, participant surveys, um, much of which asked for um, questions about their symptoms and um, so sometimes that can be biased or skewed um, because it's a subjective um, type of survey. So when someone asks you how you feel or if you feel better or worse, um, you know, sometimes people's uh, reactions might be um, skewed because they know that they're participating in a study and they know that they're supposed to feel better. So they may say that they do. Um, you know, you just never know. So. Um, that is a limitation in my opinion. The clinical context to me, um, well, first of all, um, the back to the research question, would a low fat MAP diet alter IBS-like symptoms and improve the quality of life among IBD patients? According to the data in this article, yes. Um, so how we can apply this in um, the clinical context is that um, number one, it adds to the body of li literature that confirms the efficacy of the low fat MAP diet. Um, it is um, proven to maintain the remission of IBD symptoms, and it may be useful in calming acute IBD symptoms. So um, we can use that clinically. And in our case, um, we may even uh, suggest that our 12-year-old male patient um, try the low-fat FODMAP diet um, at least temporarily into, until his symptoms subside. Um, and then maybe begin a reintroduction, reintroduction diet um, after um, remission.